Hey YouTubers, uh, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for caring about our planet. I'm going to continue reading uh, Human Radiation Studies, Remembering the Early Years, Oral History of Dr. John W. Goffman, MD, PhD, PhD. Human Radiation Studies. Let's remember that title, folks. So I'm going to read the intro at the top of the page, and then we'll continue. Conducted on December 20th, 1994, in San Francisco, California, by Loretta Hefner, archivist for the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, and Carolyn Gorley, a researcher for the Office of Human Radiation Experiments, U.S. Department of Energy. John W. Goffman was selected for the Oral History Project because of his research at the University of California, Berkeley, and his biomedical work at the Lawrence Livermore Radiation Laboratory, LLRL. The oral history covers Dr. Goffman's co-discovery of uranium-233, his involvement with isolating the first milligram of plutonium, his work as founder and director of the biomedical program at Lawrence Livermore, and the evolution of his opinions on the effects of radiation on humans. Short Biography Dr. Goffman was born in Cleveland, Ohio on September 21, 1918. He received his B.A. in chemistry from Oberlin University, Oberlin, Ohio in 1939. He received his Ph.D. in nuclear physical chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. He received his M.D. from the School of Medicine, University of California at San Francisco in 1946. He married in 1940 and has one grown child. Dr. Goffman began his career by working for the Plutonium Project as part of the Manhattan Project at the University of California, Berkeley from 1941 to 1943. So right after he got married, he started working there. In 1939, he received his Ph.D. Wow. Okay. During that time, he developed two processes for separating plutonium from uranium and fission product products of irradiated fuel. I'm going to read that again. Dr. Goffman began his career by working for the Plutonium Project as part of the Manhattan Project at the University of California, Berkeley from 1941 to 1943. During that time, he developed two processes for separating plutonium from uranium and fission products of irradiated fuel. This work, conducted with Dr. Glenn Seaborg, was the precursor to full-scale plutonium production at the Hanford nuclear site in Washington. Between 1947 and 51, Goffman was a physician in radioisotope therapy at the Donner Clinic, University of California, Berkeley. From 1947 to 1954, Goffman was an assistant professor at medical physics in the Division of Medical Physics, Department of Physics at the University of California, Berkeley. In 1954, his position turned into a full professorship, and in 1973, it became a professorship emeritus, a position he continues to hold today. He was a medical director for the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory Livermore from 1954 to 1957. From 1963 to 1969, he was an associate director at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, and from 1963 to 1966, he was director founder of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory Division of Biomedic Biology and Medicine. Goffman has published many times on such topics as lipoproteins, arterial sclerosis, and coronary heart disease, ultracentrifugal discovery, 
and analysis of serum lipoproteins. The relationship of human chromosomes to cancer. The biology and medical effects of ionizing radiation with particular reference to cancer, leukemia, and genetic diseases. And the lung cancer hazard of plutonium. Wow. So he was kind of a megaloman, a typical AMA, let's experiment on humankind. And I think his, I mean, he must have greatly regretted doing the work he did. Man, I hope he rests in peace. Let's see how long that took. That's only five minutes, okay. Oberline College, enrollment in Western Reserve Medical School. Hefner. Now this is back and forth between Hefner and Gorley. They're asking questions, okay? Hefner. Today is December 20th, 1994, and Carolyn Gorley and Her Lori Hefner are here with Dr. Goffman for the purpose of creating Dr. John Goffman's oral history. Gorley. How is it that you first became attracted to science as a profession? Goffman. I... I really was a child of the Depression. I would say my first reaction out of high school was, it would be nice to be able to get a job, any job. And there were no jobs. I spent the summer after graduating from high school trying to get a job, any job, but couldn't. Gorley. And what year was that? Goffman. 1935. I didn't have the ambition to be a scientist or anything else. I just tried to stay alive. Then I decided that maybe since I'd done well in school in mathematics and science, I'd try to get into engineering school. Because as far as my dim vision of science was concerned, engineering and science were the same thing. Someone from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, New York, had visited my high school and said that they hadn't had any students from Cleveland, Ohio, where I lived before, and that if the school nominated someone for a scholarship, there was a very good chance of getting it. The math teacher talked to me about it, and I thought it was a great opportunity. So I applied for the Rensselaer Scholarship and thought no more about it, figuring I would, I would and figuring I was going to get it. When anyone asked where I was going to go to school, if I was going to go to college, I would answer, I'm going to Rensselaer. Except when April came around, I got a letter saying, they're very happy you've been accepted for the class, but we've run out of scholarships at the level where your name came in. They... They could have sent me act they could have sent me anything actually if the tuition were fifty dollars. I didn't have fifty dollars to pay for tuition, so that ended my Rensselaer appointment. Then there was an engineering school in Cleveland, Ohio called the Case School of Applied Science. I took the ex exam for a scholarship at Case and tied for fifth, which was good enough for me to get a half scholarship which I also couldn't afford. I was about to give it up or either go to Ohio State or not just go to college. Then somebody suggested that there was a school near Ohio called Oberlein College. And I said, that's a music school and I'm not a musician. He responded, no, there's a college there as well as a conservatory. So I went down and talked to the Dean of Admissions, and he said, You're a little late for applying for a scholarship. See, it was already summer, but they were very honest and gave me a first semester scholarship with arrangements called student aid, by which you were eligible for half tuition if you did well. So with the scholarship for the first semester and the possibility of student aid, I went there with a combination of board jobs, stoking furnaces, and cleaning up snow. I managed to get through the first year, and then things got easier and easier, because I got regular jobs for my board. The Democratic Administration had a thing called the National Youth Administration, and in college, you could get a job and work up to 30 hours a month at 50 cents an hour. So that provided me with $15 a month, 
which was a very, very good thing. Roosevelt had put that in, Roosevelt had put that in, I'm sorry, I'm reading it backwards. Roosevelt put that into that situation. I got one of those NYA jobs starting at, starting my sophomore year. The Democratic Administration, the National Youth Administration. So he got subsidies to go to college. I had my chemistry, I had my chemistry the first year. A professor of chemistry named Luke Steiner, a very fine man, a good chemist, had given me an opportunity to work for him in his lab. Beginning sophomore year, I worked in his lab on his research project, which was the study of the absorption of various vapors on porous gels. I worked with him for three years, sophomore, junior, and senior year, and then I decided I ought to be a chemist. But for some strange reason, I can't really explain my senior year in college. I thought about the idea of medicine, especially the idea of doing chemical research in medicine. Dr. Steiner thought that was a good idea. At Christmas vacation, there are certain things, there are certain number of things that are very irrational in my history. I might as well just tell you. Oh, go right ahead. That's Gorley. Goffman. I decided I ought to go to med medical school. I went over to the Western Reserve Medical School in Cleveland, and I went to the front office, the dean's office. There was a very nice lady, tall lady, Julia T. Brown, and I introduced myself and said I would like to apply for admission in medical school. And she said that the medical school admissions were closed some time ago. Gorley, late again. Goffman, I'm late again. She said, why are you applying now? I said, because I just made up my mind this week to apply. Ordinarily, people should throw someone out of their office when they come in and say these things. It just didn't occur to me that, that it was brash. She said, where do you go to college? I said, Oberlein. She said, what are you majoring in? I said, chemistry. She said, aren't you a pre-med? And I said, no. I would still like to have to make up some things to be a pre-med, and because I knew I hadn't had the courses at Cat Anatomy. At, at Anatomy. Okay, I'm going to read that again. I would still have to make up some things to be a pre-med because I knew I hadn't had the courses like Cat Anatomy. It turned out. It turned out. Talk about the quirks of fate. The dean of the Western Reserve Medical School, Torod Solman was a pharmacologist, and chemistry was his love. She, Mrs. Brown, said, How are you doing in chemistry? And I said, Quite well at Oberlein. I had my record with me. She went off, saw the dean, came back, and said, Dean Solman will see you. I went in to see Dean Solman, who had a stack of journals about this high, holds his hand palms down about two feet off the floor. He would peer over the stack of journals, and he appeared to be about 70 years old at the time. He said, I understand you would like to apply for medical school, and you're a chemistry major. I said, yes. He said, have you taken the medical aptitude test? I said, what is that? And he told me, here, I'll give you the test right now. And he did. I handed it in, and he promised to let me know. Remember, I didn't have all the requirements to get in. So about four weeks later, they sent me a letter saying I was admitted and that I would have to make up the missing courses, which were embryology and cat anatomy. I couldn't get in before the fall semester, but I agreed I would dissect a, excuse me, I would dissect a cat in the summertime in Oberlein, and I did. But I did get into the embryology course. I enrolled in Western Reserve Medical School in the fall. I got along fine in medical school the first year, but I could see I was not going to learn much about chemistry in the biochemistry division of the medical school. Western Reserve had a new professor of anatomy. 
The old professor of anatomy had just died a year before, and he was a, from a Scottish school that always felt they had to terrorize medical students. But the new professor was a great guy, Norman Hoare, H-O-E-R-R, Hare or Hoare. New professor, Norman Hare. I wonder if he was really from Nazi Germany. I got to know him. He had done a lot of research and had a Ph.D. as well as an M.D. In those days, it was pretty exciting doing histochemistry on tissues. I talked to him once and he said, You know, I think I'll go back and study some more chemistry before completing my medical education. And he said, That's a good idea. I went to see the dean who admitted me and gave him my reasons. He said, It's a silly idea, he said. All the chemistry you need is here, but I wasn't convinced of that. To University of California, Berkeley, to study physical chemistry. I think I'll end here, folks. Um, let's see, what time is it? Oh, 16 minutes, just about right. So right now, it's 11.30 at night on December 31st. This is probably my very last video. Um, I keep thinking those were my last videos, but I think this really is. <laughs> My granddaughter gave me this for Christmas. So we do need to put our courage feet on. And thank you for watching and um, and listening and hearing this information. I'll probably get better reading as I move along. I usually do. So put your courage feet on. Ciao. Happy New Year. Let's make 217 the real year that humanity takes our lives back. Freedom. Ciao.